So I took one week, one week off from AEW Dynamite and all of other wrestling because I wasn't doing the ups and downs seven days ago and Cody Rhodes left the company. I mean, what the flub is going to happen if I take more time off in the future, I'll probably come back and we'll all be dead. Now look, that was a little bit much. Let's just rein it in and everybody calm down. But yes, hello, my name is Simon Miller. I'm a very weird human being, but I also possess this, the finger of power. If you don't know what the finger of power is, look at your finger and see if it has power of its own. But mine is able to give the good bits an up and the bad bits are down when it comes to professional wrestling. I didn't choose such magic, but with great power comes great responsibility. But let's up those downs for an episode of a wrestling show. Right, I am going to take things over at the start of this week's show because I am going to give it up to CT. That's right, I don't think this has ever happened before, but we did have a sign on AEW Dynamite, and that's what it said, Simon gives CT an up. And as I've always said, if you are going to go out of your way to be this kind and this nice and make me feel all warm and fuzzy in my tum-tum, I will obey your every single word. So it does get an up. And hello to CT. Dynamite also started with our tag team champions coming to the ring, because of course we were about to have a battle royal to determine the number one contenders for their tag team titles. And what I really wanted them to do was sit down and get our pad and give the good bits an up and the bad bits a down. And I realized that would be a really weird thing to do. This thing kicked off instantly too, and there were so many teams, I was just gonna read them, because I'll definitely forget someone. But we had the best friends, we had the Butcher and the Blade, good luck with your shop. We had the Gun Club, we had Silver and Reynolds, we had Santana and Ortiz, we had FTR, we had Red Dragon, we had 2.0, we had Private Party, and we had the Young Bucks. I'll never forget, in a tag team battle royal, both guys from a team have to be thrown to the floor, otherwise the team is still in it. This was absolute carnage too, with bodies just being hurled over the top rope. But I suppose the first major story beat was that after Private Party had been eliminated, Matt Hardy once again was like, you absolute goobers, why can't you do anything? And he walked out. Almost like he's planting seeds for a face turn because his brother may be about to arrive in the promotion. Santana also chucked out both members of 2.0, so his big push continues. But then very sadly for him, Ortiz was eliminated courtesy of the Young Bucks. And then we had a big stare down between Matt Jackson, Nick Jackson and Cash and Dax. Because one day, maybe one day soon, those two teams are going to go at it again. And it will be lovely. There's now just cause for that as well because FTR did get rid of Nick and around about the same time Orange Cassidy saved his best friend Trent and then Bobby Fish was also eliminated because of course he is. He's a fish. He's not a land mammal. He doesn't know what he's doing. He needs an ocean. Tony Blanchard then tried to help Cash but this was the worst use of help ever because John Silver got rid of him instead and then we had another stare down between Trent and Santana and the best thing about this is that every single fan in the arena knew what AEW was doing. This was a wink and a nod to their street fight a couple of years ago and as a massive wrestling nerd I am always going to appreciate callbacks. Final four were eventually Silver Matt Jackson, O'Reilly and Dax. This is when AEW went proper pure wrestling nonsense. But as I've said time and time again, never get rid of it. Because at this stage, Bobby Fish just swam back to the ring. <laughs> And he saw Dax, he was like, you know what? I'm gonna throw you over the top rope. And everyone's like, yeah, this is fine. We know that he's officially out the thing, but what do you want us to do about it? We're busy. We also made sure to give Johnny Hungy his moment because he was eliminated by both other guys. But sadly, this basically caught Matt Jackson unawares. Kyle O'Reilly dumped him out, which means Red Dragon are going to the pay-per-view. But they went into more feuds because instantly the Young Bucks, O'Reilly and Fishman were going at it like, you screwed us over, what are you doing? When Hangman and Adam Page came out because, of course, recently Kyle O'Reilly and Bob had been assholes to him. So everybody started to get into it. The best thing about this is that Matt Jackson and Nick Jackson kind of just looked on because, of course, there was more teasing here. Maybe, just maybe, them and the hangman are going to get back together. And then it got even more crazy because Adam Cole came out, but this didn't really work because our world champion was just throwing fists all over the place. And after some assistance from John Silver, who was like, man, I love you, Adam, he threw Kyle O'Reilly back in the ring who got hit with the buckshot lariat. So once again, our champ was standing tall. Page also finished this off by stealing the whole Adam Cole story time thing. And the ending of his story was basically, I'm gonna take on Adam Cole at the pay-per-view and I'm gonna bury him. That's what he said. He's going to kill him. 
which makes him a little bit nutty. Also, shout out to Bobby Fish here, who could not understand a word of what Hangman Adam Page was saying. So this whole thing was so damn layered, and it was so damn crazy, and it is getting up. Brian Danielson then set the world on fire because he mentioned that he'd be mentored by William Regal, and that's one of the problems with Daniel Garcia, his opponent for the evening. He's being taught by 2.0, he doesn't like that at all. And I was a bit like Brian, like they are his dads. You gotta give him some respect. It was right from one promo to another too, as MJF came out into the ring. And make sure you sit down, put on your listening hat, because we may just have seen the promo of the year. Now say whatever you want about Maxwell Jacob Freeman, but he knows what to do and when to do it. So here he got a microphone. He was like, look, I'm about to be real with you guys. I'm about to be emotional. We all keep talking about that photo of me and CM Punk that is doing the rounds, but that picture meant everything to me. And let me tell you why. Because as he was growing up in school and having some successes like joining the football team, he continually got bullied for being Jewish to the point that after he had made the squad, his teammates, the people that he thought were his friends, threw money at him. As a Jewish man, this resonated to me a lot, especially when MJF went, hey, is there any Jews in the house? I was like, bah. and I realized I was just sat at home. Like I say, I'm a little bit odd. But MJF has been very vocal about this throughout his entire career, and his delivery was so on point, it hit me right in the feels, especially when he went on to say that CM Punk was his inspiration. He would look at CM Punk and say, well, I love professional wrestling. If he do it, why can't I? Which is when we got to January 2014, and CM Punk left wrestling, and as far as Maxwell is concerned, turn his back on the fans. It hurt him so much that he paused his own dream until he was on Instagram one day and stumbled across his account where he saw a picture of Brian Danielson and CM Punk shaking hands when all of a sudden he realized, man, what am I doing? I am not going to let CM Punk hold me back and from now on, I will get to the top and when I am there, I will never quit because I don't want to be like him. Punk then used this moment to come out to try and talk to Maxwell like, man, was that all true? Was that all true? But MJF just walked off and I kid you not, at so many points during this, it looked like Maxwell may be about to cry. I ain't gonna lie to you, I'm gonna be honest, I felt quite emotional too. This was the complete opposite to the usual here comes a wrestler to cut a promo, which I'm totally cool with. I like all of those as well, but it also took this feud and it put it on another level, which is kind of nuts because it was already quite high to begin with. So I can't wait for this now, like I actually can't wait for it. The twists and turns just keep on coming and you know that MJF is going to use this somehow when we do get to Revolution. So not only am I gonna give it a round of applause, not only am I gonna remind you all this is the best feud in wrestling right now, but it's not just gonna get an up. No, oh, that was. It is gonna get the golden up, that's right. So in short, just make sure you go and watch this. Maybe make sure nobody's cutting onions at the time. Garcia in 2.0 then responded to Danielson and Garcia was like, listen, Bri, I don't need any of your help because I'm ultraviolet. And I looked it up and I was wrong. I was 99% sure that was a Nintendo 64 game from 1999. We then got it confirmed too. And because I'm an idiot, I didn't even talk about this a couple of weeks ago, but the tease was right in front of our face that Penta was about to become Dark Penta. And on this evening on AEW Dynamite, he made it very clear and he has turned back to the dark side. If you followed his career, you know all about this as well. And Alex Abrahantes is now like some kind of vampire, but fair play to that guy. He commits to this to 100%, so I can't get mad about it. And I'm not gonna call him Dark Penta. I'm gonna call him Penta Dark, because it sounds a little bit like he's Coke Zero. He was also teaming up with Pirate Pack to take on the Kings of the Black Throne. And this was just ridiculous. Like these four together, may be perfect. I mean, I'm exaggerating for effect, but they just never have bad matches and it's so flipping entertaining. I mean, I think we had a Penta dive and a pack 450 in the first 30 seconds of the thing. And when Brody King tagged in to try and make amends, my word, he was just suplexing fools and he's so damn big, it looked quite cool. They then went for Dante's Inferno, but Pac was having none of that. And if you can believe it, he did a German suplex to Brody. And that also looked cool, because Pac is not so tall and Mr. King is really, really tall. So I honestly thought he was gonna break his head. It also turns out that if you do go evil, your brain gets bigger. Because after Malachi Black had snuck in there, it was all like, ha ha, I'm gonna spit some mist into someone's face, which admittedly is a very strange thing to say. Penta was like, no, no, you're not. He put his hand over his mouth 
I presume that Malachi then swallowed it. It was like, oh man, it tastes disgusting. And he then hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. And somewhat surprisingly, Penta and Pac won. Amazingly, we still weren't done though, because instantly the Kings jumped these two. And after they were gonna hit them with a shovel, because why wouldn't you, the lights went out. So straight away, I was dancing around. I love a wrestling lights out spot. If you can believe it too, when they came back on, Cody Rhodes was standing in the ring. Couldn't even keep a straight face. I am, of course, lying to you. I just wanted to get a reaction, but it was still pretty damn awesome because there was Buddy Matthews, Buddy Murphy, whatever the hell you want to call him. He has officially joined All Elite Wrestling. He got a bunch of noise, which is always cool. And after he pretended he was going to take out Malachi Black, because of course they have a history, he was lying to us. He beat up Penta and Pack, and I enjoyed all of this, mostly because, like I say, the story actually goes further than AEW, so the multiverse is here. It also ended with Murphy curb stomping Penta onto a chair, so next week he's going to be like Penta Dark Dark because he's going to be so mad, and all of this was just a very, very good segment, which also is going to have huge complications down the line. It is getting it up. We then got a video package reminding us that at the pay-per-view, we are going to get Britt Baker versus Thunder Rosa for the Women's Championship. And let's be honest, Rosa should probably win that when it was time for more great promos because out came Chris Jericho and out came Eddie Kingston. Kingston was annoyed instantly, which is always hilarious. And he wanted to know why there are a bunch of security guards here and why are we speaking to each other I ain't no sports entertainer, I'm a wrestler, so why don't we just fight? And really, summed up right there is why everybody loves Mr. Kingston. Jericho still wanted to have a conversation, so he admitted that when Eddie did arrive in the company, he didn't know who he was, and he actually thought he looked a bit like a jobber. But after seeing him work and after seeing him talk, he realized he was gonna be a babyface star, and straight away Eddie went, babyface, what's a babyface? <laughs> this man is the best. Jericho then continued with these kind of nice, but kind of passive aggressive comments, because he said to Eddie, I know what your problem is. Here you are at 38 years old, and you finally hit the big time, but when I was 38 years old, I was already a major star. I had won multiple world championships. I was a millionaire. And I know deep down in your tum tum, you can't take it. Kingston then snapped back that he was only able to do that because Eddie wasn't around, but also because he politicked his way to the top. And once again, he doesn't do that stuff. So why don't we get our fisty cuffs and smash them into each other's face? Chris still didn't want to do that. and had one last thing to lay at Eddie Kingston's feet. And that was that he suffered from achieve me phobia. I was like, there's no way it's called achieve me phobia. But I looked it up and actually, yes, if you do have a fear of success, it's called achieve me phobia. So my big question is when we were coming up with all these words, why didn't we make it as literal as that one? Things did get kind of deep here though, because Jericho was all, your hero was your uncle and he failed. Your other hero was your father, but he failed. So now you think if you ever do get to the top of the mountain, you're gonna fail too. And this is when I was totally bought into this because Jericho was delivering lines. Eddie Kingston was reacting like it was all real. This was great. Eventually they agreed that they would have a match at Revolution with Jericho promising that if Eddie Kingston does beat him, he will pay him all the respect in the world. And again, Eddie ended this great because he was like, all right, look, I don't want that Jericho that had a mimosa fight with Orange Cassidy. I want the kind of chick Jericho that Paul Levesque hated. <laughs> So I got my baseball out because this was going inside. So it really should be no surprise that a promo off between these two guys was absolutely brilliant. But if you don't plan to watch that, change it right now and look at it. Look at me. I'm invested in the match. That's all it took. Up. We then had a backstage skit with Matt Hardy and Andrade. And from nowhere, we learned that at the pay-per-view, it is going to be Hardy, Andrade and Isaiah Cassidy taking on Sting, Darby Allen. Sammy Guevara. And I walked around my house looking under the sofa, looking under the table, because I was like, what on earth? Where did it come from? There's no way that's going to be bad, though, and I bet it ties into a massive turn for Hardy when we were back in the ring. And it was time to find out who else was joining the face of the Revolution ladder match. Because this week we had Ricky Starks versus Ten. And while the result of this one was always going to be pretty obvious, especially because before this, every single person in that ladder match was absolutely massive. It was fine. It was OK. I enjoyed it for what it was. Up. And I suppose it was a little bit short, but this Dynamite episode was absolutely packed. And after Ricky Starks had tried to rip off Ten's mask, he was like, no, no, nobody can see my horribly disfigured face. 
I've made that up. I'm sure he's a lovely person. Well, I know he is. I've seen his face. We've got, of course, here. Point is, Ricky Starks hit the spear. He got the one, two, three. He's going to be in the ladder match, which again is important because you need somebody to do the dives. It's 2022 wrestling. We also had more falling out in the back after this between Red Dragon and the Young Bucks and Adam Cole. And honestly, we are just planting seeds here. And I bet it ends when a certain somebody comes back. I mean, I'm not going to tease you. I'm talking about Kenny Omega. It was then time for some proper sports entertainment, so I bet somewhere Eddie Kingston was like, no man, I don't want to see it, because the TBS Championship was on the line as Jade Cargill took on the bunny. I was like, well, this is really nice. This is really important. Like, it's all well and good fighting humans in wrestling, but the animal community also deserves their platform. Once again, that was just a really stupid, dumb joke. I'm going to see myself out. The bunny was able to get some momentum here and actually push Jade Cargill quite far because she gave her a Russian leg sweep into Barry Barricade. And at this point, Matt Hardy was like, look, I have some more stuff to say. So he came out to the ring. He told Mark Sterling that he was going to delete him. And that was not by accident. Watch this space. And then back in the ring, the bunny kind of jumped at Jade, who grabbed her and slammed her ass with a spine buster. My word, that was pretty good. Hardy was then casting distractions so the bunny could go and get her brass knucks. But at the same time, Mark Sterling passed the title to Jade Cargill. And this was a little bit weird because they charged at each other. And I think we were told the belt protected her from the brass knucks. That's a little bit like people who play rock, paper, scissors, and they go, oh, I've got rock, paper, scissors at the same time. They do this with their hand. It's like, that's not how it works. That's kind of stupid. All it meant is that the referee got sick of Hardy and Sterling and sent them both to the back. And after the bunny went for her finishing move, that was reversed into the jaded. And I think Jade Cargill now is what, like 28 to 0? And she even asked the question, who's next? She knows what she's doing. Turns out we were going to find out who was next because Ty Conte arrived and said, I'll take you on at the pay-per-view. And then even got into it with the bunny in the ring because, of course, they have history. Unfortunately, this meant she wasn't looking at Jade Cargill who pump kicked her right in the face. And it was only then that Anna Jay came out as an Anna. You were a terrible, terrible friend. You like 82 years late. So once again, this was fine. And you can do all of these shenanigans as long as you keep it to like one a show. The problem always comes when every single match ends the same way. Like I say, I was entertained enough. Up. Keith Lee was then being interviewed about the ladder match where he said, oh man, I have some history with Ricky Starks. Then Ricky arrived in this impression of Keith Lee that was kind of funny. And that was basically that. But it probably means when we get to the pay-per-view, they're going to do something crazy. Which brought us to our main event, which was Brian Danielson versus Danny Garcia. And if you're like me, you have been waiting for this because it's just like two wrestling machines smashing together. I'm not sure what fans in attendance were expecting because they did go really quiet here and it didn't necessarily go the length of time that I would have liked. But seriously, the kind of wrestling that they were doing to begin with is just silly. It is just nuts. Garcia is going to be ridiculously good in a few years and there ain't no two ways about it. Right here, right now, Danielson is one of the best in the world. Garcia tried to work over Brian's knee too because he was like, man, I'm going to get rid of your vertical base. So Danielson went, all right, well, what I'm going to do to you is suplex you to the outside. And when he did roll him back in the ring, he was just stomping him and he was giving him suplex after suplex after suplex. Like I've already said, he's just so damn good and he makes it look so easy. He eventually locked in the cattle mutilation too, but Garcia knew he didn't want to be in that. So he transitioned out to it into an ankle lock. But very sadly, he doesn't have the same kind of experience. So Brian Danielson got out of that. He just booted his head in over and over again. Honestly, it was properly, properly brutal. Before he finally locked in the triangle and he got the tap out win. Straight away, Danielson wanted to put him over though and said, oh man, can you believe how ultra violent he was? When 2.0 felt offended, they're like, no, no, we don't like it. So they jumped Danielson. But of course, who is Brian kind of friends, kind of not with at the moment? It was John Moxley. He came down. He beat absolutely everybody up before he got right in the face of Brian Danielson. The whole point was that Brian is going to accept his challenge and they are going to fight the pay-per-view and they promised they were going to bleed all over the place. And what I want to happen here is that done happen. Pick whoever you want to win. I don't think it matters. But then have him have a team, have them come together because it's just something I never thought we were going to do in 2022. So all of this I think is really intriguing and it's getting it up. Which brings us to the end of another episode of AEW Dynamite and flub me sideways did we do a lot on this evening. I mean, you can tell there is a pay-per-view just around the corner and I'm so excited for MJF versus CM Punk round two. It makes me sick. 
literally stupid thing to say, but overall is getting it up. Now, please do leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's AEW Dynamite and call me an a-hole like it. Oh, Simon, you don't know what you're talking about. You're right. Somebody needs to stop me. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Hello to whatculture.com. We will keep you up to date with all the crazy wrestling news. Make sure you watch another video because YouTube loves that and so will you. And we're on social media. Come say hello. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you as always for giving us your time. It means the world. Make sure you have the best day of your life to the point it makes the news. And I will see you soon.